Hello again, everyone. I'm Sarah Carter here, um, and I helped Cindy out a couple weeks ago with a talk on perspective, and she asked me if I wouldn't mind helping out again this week, and I am more than happy to do that and to bring what's on, been on my mind to all of you, what God's been re revealing to me. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about being strong and courageous, specifically in that verbiage being mentioned in the Bible. If you've been around Celebration Church at all and you know Pastor Keith Pittman and have had the pleasure of hearing one of his sermons, odds are you've heard him talk about when things are repeated in the Bible because he really enjoys this topic too. He calls it God's foot stomp. Uh, teachers do this in class when they're teaching towards a test or when they're gearing up for students. They'll stomp on the floor when it's some, a point they want you to really remember for that test. So Pastor Keith says that this is God's way of giving that hint that you should really pay attention to what he's about to say or reveal through whatever the action is or whatever the teaching is because it's about to be very important. When we talk about this repetition, we tend to think about the Gospels because the Gospels are very repetitive in their feel and some of their verbiage. Specifically, there are only three miracles in the Gospels that are across all four of them. There are several miracles in the Gospels in general, but three are only repeated in all four of them, and that is Jesus' resurrection, the feeding of the 5,000, and healing the blind. Um, we're... When you think about why the Gospels in particular, but the Bible in general, why is it so repetitive? Why do these themes keep coming back up? Why does specific exact verbiage keep coming back up? It's because back then in biblical times, the literacy rate was way down. There wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of documents to begin with, but then there also weren't a lot of people who could read those documents. So relying on the spoken word, was how people got their news, got their recipes, you know, there was no Pinterest. It's how they got any information was being told it, and the people telling it would repeat it often and often and often. So repetition was a way of teaching anything. There weren't many records being kept back then outside of royal documents. Um, and there was also this trouble with language, that even that there's so many languages in that area going on at that same time, that even if a story were to be transcribed and written down, it wasn't necessarily going to always translate exactly the same. So points that needed to be gotten across had to be repeated over and over to have them stand the test of language, literacy, and travel. That was why things were really repeated a lot. So why is this on my mind now, who thinks of these type of things? Uh, <laughs> I was recently conducting a Bible study group with some small business owners, and a topic that kept that arose that we dove a little bit deeper into was how courageous it was of those small business owners to open a business at all, be it on the heels of this pandemic, be it before the pandemic and then carrying it through, or gosh, some of the most courageous ones were opening it during when they saw a need that they could fill with whatever their service was. So we discovered that this theme of courage kept coming up. And then we were like, well, I think I've heard that phrase several times in the Bible. Let's dig in. So we dug into this theme and discovered that God frequently throughout the Bible on the eve of big events that uh, care, uh, that people throughout the Bible are facing or on the eve of them really facing some opposition to their faith, Bob, God tells them verbatim, be strong and courageous. Um, so we dug into that and we found three instances, three persons of the Bible that this verbiage keeps coming up and we dove into those and so I want to bring that to you today and those people are we're going to dive, dig into their stories a little bit more is Joshua, David, and when Paul writes to the Corinthians the first time. Um, as we go through this I'll pose some questions at the end of each person we talk about that I hope will make this biblical time discussion and this biblical time usage of be strong and courageous translate a little bit more into your your life uh, into your modern times 
So let's start with Joshua. We're going to go into Deuteronomy. So we're going to throw back to Old Testament, obviously. And here we are at the shores of the Jordan, of the Jordan River. Moses has been told he's not going to be crossing the Jordan, that Joshua is going to be his successor into the Promised Land, finally. And here they are standing there, probably under the shade of some tree, looking out over the vast land beyond the Jordan. And this conversation takes place between Moses and Joshua, where Moses tells Joshua and the people and all of Israel that they need to be bold and courageous for the Lord is going to go with you and he will not forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 7 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, here it comes again, be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. So twice in just those two verses, and if that's not enough, just barely chapters later in the next book, Joshua 1, verses 6 through 7, God talks directly to Joshua. Right after Moses has said this very thing, God talks directly to Joshua and says, verse, Joshua 1, verse 6, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gives you. So, in not so many chapters, God says it four times in this situation. This is a big, big deal that it's repeated so much. And you think about the gravity of this moment. Forty years these people have roamed in the wilderness They've, as God has tried to prepare them to make this move into this land that, they, that he promised their ancestors. And they've doubted God a lot, right? They, I mean, they've doubted if this is the right call, if this is the right method, if this is the right person, if this is the right food. They've doubted, <laughs> they've doubted everything about this situation because they were comfortable in the circumstances they'd come to know over time. They'd really grown very comfortable with the space they were in, with the space they'd come from and known for hundreds of years before. This comfort zone they'd cultivated. Here they are facing this moment that they're going to leave this comfort zone and it's going to take strength and courage. So God is making sure they know and their leader know that that's what's going to be required. So my questions for you are, what circumstances in your life have you gotten overly comfortable with over the past however long? But God's back there telling you this change needs to be made and you need to be strong and courageous about it. What circumstances is that for you? And maybe if the visual helps, because the visual helps me, close your eyes and think about it. What's your Jordan River? What do you have to cross in a very strong and courageous way to step into a new circumstance? So good. It's I love this repetition and this, just the message it's trying to bring to us. Let's now turn to David. So... David, right, is a warrior. He is a, he has been a warrior. God literally tells him, you have shed a lot of blood. Um, but he has this vision that he wants to build the temple, a permanent place for God's presence. Now, go ahead and turn to 1 Chronicles 22 and keep a kind of a finger on 28 as well because they might as well be read side by side they're just one giant repeat of the same situation so david is talking to his people and with solomon and tells him that he's had it on his heart to build 
this temple, this permanent structure. But to modernize God a little bit, he goes, mm, no thanks. You're a warrior. You shed a lot of blood. I don't need that as the opening to my new place and where I'm going to dwell. Let's have Solomon take care of it. But you can prep for it. That's pretty much this conversation that's going on. And Chronicles 23, 13 has where David tells Solomon what he's going to need to move forward. So it says, 23, 1 Chronicles 22, 13. Then you will have success if you are careful to observe the decrees and laws that the Lord gave Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. And like I said, 28 might as well be read right along with it. So here we go. First Chronicles 28, 20. David also says to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. I find it really fascinating that here's David, kind of like Moses, telling his successor, Solomon, like Moses to Joshua, that, hey, I had this dream and I had this big vision and I had this big pushed by God to achieve this thing, but not me, but you must now carry on. And so I wonder in both these situations, but we'll stick with David, I wonder, is David also telling himself this, be strong and courageous, as he's officially handing over his dream, this vision, his life's work to his son, as something he needs to steal himself to do, turning that big dream over to someone else. Is that something he's thinking? And likewise, in your life, is there a situation where you need to courageously hand over the reins to someone else that for whatever reason, You've been called to have this big dream, this big vision, this big thought, this big anything, but someone else is going to carry it out, and that's going to be where you have to be strong and courageous. Is that in your life? Uh, it's, it's been in mine a couple of times for sure. So we've been hanging out in the Old Testament now. Let's bring it forward to Paul when he's writing to the Corinthians the first time. When Paul first writes to the Corinthians, Corinth is still a mess. Uh, if you've heard Tall Tale or visited or seen documentaries on Amsterdam's Red Light District, New Orleans Bourbon Street, Las Vegas, some areas of Paris, all of these modern locations have that similar vibe to what Cornet's got going on during Paul's time. They're not exactly pinnacles of godliness <laughs> by any stretch of the mean, yet somehow in Cornet and Paul's age, a church springs up. And Paul is writing to them to encourage them, but also in this first letter to the church that's still very, very young, Paul is trying to answer some of their questions because Paul, as he says in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, they're still infants in Christ. They still, they're not getting solid food. They're still kind of getting, they're still getting their footing under them because they're really not ready for the hard stuff yet. They're still asking the, the basic questions of food, head coverings, lawsuits, married life, um, another different, very fundamental aspects of their new church and their new faith. But Paul senses in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and 34 that there's some backsliding going on, that people are starting to revert to these old, very immoral ways, but still trying to call themselves believers in Christ. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and 34, 
Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. Very short and to the point. Stop doing this. What are you doing? Um, and then he says, at the end, towards the end of the letter, as he's wrapping it up, it's advice that he repeats in different verbiage, in different ways, in, er in other letters that he's written. But in this instance, he says it in the repetitive verbiage, be strong and courageous, we've been focusing on. And it's so poignant. So 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14. All it says is be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. How, how beautiful of a summary is that for the encouragement of brand new church needs and the faith of intense opposition to their existence and to their new sense of morality that up until this point they didn't have. Faith takes that courage, strength, and love always. But especially when you're facing backsliding, bad company, like he said, and bad influences. Um, personally, when I was initially saved, I tried to keep my life the same. I tried to keep doing the same things with the same people and the same crowd. Everything the same. Except now I added on this faith thing. And that approach really didn't work very well. It took me some time to figure out that I really needed to remove some relationships from my life, remove some th habits and some things that I was doing that really truly weren't allowing me to fully accept God's way and God's grace and God's saving. Um, it was tough. It, it didn't do it lightly, but I did do it intentionally. And so my question for you is are there people, habits, thoughts, or anything in your life that's causing you or tempting you into backsliding? Um, like the people of Corneth were going through as they were founding their church. Where in your life do you need to be strong and courageous in your faith? So in your family, your work environment, your neighborhood, um, any other life arenas? where you really need to be strong and courageous in your faith. So repetition throughout the Bible is done intentionally to really make us pay attention, hear that foot stomp, catch the gravity of that moment in time and how it translates to our circumstances today. And I challenge you as you move forward to see and hear those relatable moments where God's calling you to be strong and courageous in your faith. Um, and then be intentional about taking action when you recognize those because odds are he's telling you to do something. Uh, so thank you for giving me the space to tell you what's been on my heart and mind. Tell me, Tell you what God's been asking me to dig deeper into and share it with you and ask you to dig deeper into it too. I hope it serves you. I hope it makes you think and gives you some pause. And I hope to have the opportunity again sometime to present to you. Until then, I'm wishing you many blessings and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.